Welcome back to part 5 of the CISSP exam cram series and today we're covering domain 5 which is identity and access management. This is a tough domain for a lot of people. I have a lot of tips to help make this an easier process as you prep for the big day. So let's get down to it. Welcome back to the CISSP exam cram series. Today we are focused on domain five in the series of eight domains featured in the CISSP exam. So this is lesson number five. If you're watching this video today, I expect the eight part series will be feature complete within the week. And remember, I have some supplemental lessons out here designed to help you prepare for the exam more quickly, including a session on memorization tips. These are memory devices and techniques for those heavy memorization areas on the exam, of which there are several. Another that focuses on the quantitative risk analysis formulas, another big area where you're expected to master the content. So I walk you through a real world example so you can see every one of those formulas actually used, which is tough to find these days. And finally, I have a series out there, a session out there rather, on uh, hacking your exam prep. So basically detailing how I prepared for this exam more quickly over the period of just a couple of weeks. And also, I'm going to put a, a PDF copy of this presentation out here by request. Do make sure that you hit the uh, notification bell on the channel. That's how you'll get the heads up every time I release a new video in the series. And look for that PDF link in the video description. Uh, I've mentioned it before, I'll say it again, I'm a big fan of the official exam study guide because it has 1,300 practice questions, it has hundreds of flashcards to help you memorize the content where you need to, and it has searchable text. All very handy. I've got a link in the video description. And today we are focused on Domain 5, Identity and Access Management. Let's take a look at the official outline from the ISC Squared website. So we have control physical and logical access to assets. We have managing identification and authentication. There's another term that'll come in into play here and that's accountability. Uh, integrating identity as a third party service. We'll talk about the three most popular standards or implementations. Uh, managing authorization mechanisms. Another key memorization area, so we'll talk through the authorization mechanisms, and then finally, uh, managing the identity and access provisioning lifecycle. So let's dive into domain five, and we'll start by defining identification. So this is where a subject claims an identity, typically by providing their username. And then authentication is where the subject proves their identity typically by providing credentials like a password, or in the case of multi-factor authentication, providing a password and then something more, depending on the system we're working with. Authorization and accountability. So authorization comes after authentication, where a system will authorize access based on that proven identity. And then accountability are the auditing logs and trails that record events related to that identity that is performing action. So it gives us that historical record. So authorization comes after authentication and accountability provides evidence uh, should we need it later on. But identification plus authentication plus auditing equals accountability. So we don't have accountability without identification, authentication, and that auditing trail. So primary authentication factors. We talked about multi-factor authentication in a previous domain. It comes up here in the form of primary authentication factors. You should recognize these principles. Something you know, like a PIN or a password. Something you have, like a trusted device. And then something you are, like a fingerprint or a retinal scan. Retina scan. So multi-factor authentication leverages those components, which means we're providing two or more authentication factors. This is gonna be more secure than a single authentication factor for sure. Now, do remember that passwords are considered the weakest form of authentication. However, password policies can help here uh, by enforcing complexity and history. So we don't have weak passwords and we don't reuse passwords. Smart cards are a good option, which include typically a, a microprocessor and, and a certificate. Uh, 
uh, which would go back to uh, the trusted authority from which it's issued so we could trace it back to a trusted source. And then tokens are sometimes used to create one-time passwords. These come up in, in odds and ends scenarios like uh, one-time guest scenarios, or I've seen it in, in cases where a user is in a location where they don't have you know cellular access, for example, to, uh, to provide that second factor. Um, and then finally, bio, biometric methods, which identify users based on characteristics like uh, a fingerprint or a retina scan. Now, around biometric, you're going to need to know the crossover error rate and the two components that help you determine the crossover error rate. And this actually came up for me on the exam, and it's nothing that you're going to know intuitively. You're going to have to memorize this. So the crossover error rate is based on... Uh, so biometric auth authentication in... In general, is based on characteristics like fingerprints or retina scans. So, so something you are in that list of primary factors, right? The crossover error rate identifies the accuracy of a biometric method, and it shows where the false rejection rate is equal to the false acceptance rate. So, where these two meet, that is the crossover. Error rate. So let's talk single sign-on. So this is a mechanism that allows our subjects to authenticate once and then access multiple objects without authenticating again. So some common single sign-on standards out there include SAML, Sesame, CryptoNight, OAuth, and OpenID. In fact, for the exam, the three I think you should focus on are SAML, OAuth 2.0, and OpenID. So OAuth 2.0 is the standard when it comes to OAuth, um, but you'll need to know the high-level scenarios where each of these, these more or less factor. So going down that road, Security Assertion mark Markup Language, or SAML, is an XML-based uh, open standard for exchanging authentication between parties, in particular between an identity provider and a service provider. Uh, the most common place I see SAML come up is in uh, Active Directory Federation services. What I will say about SAML is this seems to be kind of on the way out. I, I see some folks that have been using this for years. I don't see a lot of organizations adopting this sort of uh, federation scenario very often. Um, OAuth 2.0 is an open standard uh, where we see authorization used by authenticating that user using their Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, your social accounts without exposing their password. You use these every day, I'm sure. And then OpenID is another open standard that provides decentralized authentication, allowing users to log into multiple unrelated websites, one set of credentials using a third-party service that's called an OpenID provider. So just a couple of things here. So, so SAML comes up a lot in federation scenarios. Like I mentioned, uh, Active Directory Federation Services is where I have seen it most commonly. Uh, OAuth 2.0 was developed by the, uh, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's updated through RFP. So RFP is the same process used to, to update uh, protocol standards like TCP IP, for example. And OpenID is an open standard, but it's managed through the OpenID Foundation. And in fact, Microsoft, Google, Facebook are all OAuth 2.0 um, you know, compatible providers. OpenID, when we look at OpenID, like Facebook, for example, isn't actually open, isn't actually an OpenID provider, but they have an OpenID-like standard of their own that allows you to use your OpenID. And similarly, Google, not OpenID either. So AAA protocols, there are several protocols that, are, that provide centralized authentication, authorization, and accounting services. Quite typically, we see these in network access scenarios like VPN. So uh, a network access server is a client to a RADIUS server, and the RADIUS server provides the, uh, the AAA services, the authentication, authorization, and accounting. So common implementations here we have. Uh, Radius, which uses UDP and encrypts the password. We have TACAX, which uses TCP and encrypts the entire session. And then Diameter, which is based on Radius, but is not compatible with Radius. I, I can't remember seeing Diameter actually in live use. But the difference here, Radius uses encrypts password only. TACAX encrypts the entire session. And 
And Radius uses UDP and TechX uses TCP. So I see Radius come up a lot in the Windows world and, and a lot of times interacting with, with Cisco and other third-party VPN appliances. And TACAX comes up very commonly in the, in the Cisco world. But network access or remote access systems typically are what use these AAA protocols. So identity and access provisioning lifecycle refers to creation, management, and deletion of accounts. Uh, pretty, pretty simple lifecycle at the basis. So the core component there, creation, management, and deletion. The key that I think you want to remember here is that accounts should be deep provisioned promptly on separation of that principal, be that an employee or a vendor or a contractor. Uh, one, of the, one of the key practices there is making sure that accounts don't linger. So a key area you want to be familiar with when it comes to identity and access management are authorization mechanisms. So access control models use different types of authorization mechanisms, basically methods to control who can access specific objects. And there are a few different types here. So let's go through those that you need to be familiar with. So we'll start with implicit deny. Essentially in the implicit deny model, the, uh, the subject can only access an object if they are explicitly granted access. And then there's an access control ma matrix, which includes subjects and objects, and they're assigned privileges. So essentially when a subject attempts an action, the system checks the access control matrix to determine if the subject has appropriate privileges. Now you'll notice I'm using subjects and objects quite a lot, right? Remember these from domain three? If not, you may want to go back and take a look, but just to summarize for you here, remember the subject is the entity that is attempting to access. So that's going to be a user or a system or an application. And the object is the resource that's being accessed, be that a document or a system or a database or whatever, but that's the resource. All right, continuing on authorization mechanisms, we have capability tables. So capability tables are focused on subjects like users, groups, and roles. And they, it's another way to basically identify privileges that are uh, assigned to subjects, but they're focused on the, the subjects. There's a constrained interface, which uses a constrained or restricted interface to restrict uh, what users can do or see based on their privileges. So applications constrain the interface using different methods. So I think that's one of the key things to remember with regards to constrained. And then finally, we have content dependent control. So this is going to restrict access to data based on the content within an object. A good example of this is a database view, which is a content dependent control. And last one in the authorization mechanisms is context dependent control, which requires a specific activity before granting users access. A good example of this would be a data flow for a transaction selling digital products. For example, you don't, uh, you don't see your order number until you've completed, you know, the order process and you've placed your order and your, your payment has been processed. So, so there are precursors that have to happen in the chain of, of activity before you see the next detail. Now, there are three principles related to authorization mechanisms that are going to be really important on the exam. So I want to touch on those quickly here. And that's uh, first, need to know. So this principle ensures that subjects are granted access only to what they need to know. So that means that clearance to access is, you know, one step, but they're only granted access if they actually need it to perform a job function. And then there's the principle of least privilege, which ensures that subjects are granted only the privileges they need to perform their work. Um, the only difference is that uh, least privilege will also include rights to take action on a system. And you'll you'll hear about least the, the concept of least privilege in, in the context of role-based access control quite typically, that we only we only assign the roles and group memberships. Uh, that provide the minimum capability for one to complete their job. And then in terms of uh, securing uh, authorization and, and access, uh, separation of duty. So basically splitting tasks into two or more employees. So you'll see this, for example, in the form of privileged identity, where when uh, one uh, 
administrator wants to perform a highly sensitive or privileged ac- action, they will uh, elevate uh, their their privileges or request elevation of their privileges, and somebody else will have to approve that elevation. So this is going to help prevent fraud and errors by creating a system of checks and balances. So, so the same person is not performing uh, multiple tasks that that provide the ability to uh, to commit that fraud. So, for example, uh, we don't allow someone to assign themselves administrative privileges on a system and then perform administrative actions in a vacuum where nobody else is aware of that. So for the exam, definitely know these these three principles, understand how they fit into this discussion. So let's talk about access control models. So like those authorization mechanisms, access control models are going to be very important for the exam for domain five. So di- discretionary access control. So in this model, Every object has an owner, and the owner can grant or deny access to other objects at their discretion. So the fact that the owner can grant or deny access at their discretion is what makes it discretionary. The NTFS file system that's very commonly used on Windows for many years gives us that sort of uh, model. Role-based access control, something we also see in the Windows world quite uh, typically is where we use roles and groups. You'll actually see this in many uh, cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure, for example, where they're using roles or groups. So instead of assigning permissions directly to users, user accounts are placed into a role or or a group to, uh, to give them those privileges. And basically that allows the system to scale more effectively typically mapped to job roles. So so the the roles or the groups that I'm added to are going to depend on my job roles. And in many large organizations, they'll have template user accounts where the template account is already a member of the right roles and groups, and they will simply clone that as they bring new users in or make a copy of it. And then there's rule-based access control, uh, where you have the, the key principle here is global rules apply to all subjects. Uh, and within this model, uh, the, these rules are sometimes called restrictions or filters. You'll commonly see this in the world of firewalls, where you have a firewall that uses rules that allow or block traffic to all users equally. Continuing on, we have attribute-based access control, which uh, really focuses on rules that can include multiple attributes. It's going to be more flexible than the rule-based access control model we were just talking about. This is uh, oftentimes used by software-defined networks. And then there is mandatory access control, which uh, relies on the use of labels applied to both subjects and objects. Uh, So for example, if a user has a label of top secret, then they can be granted access to a top secret document. But in that example, both the subject and the object would have matching labels. This is sometimes called uh, a lattice-based model. And, And it's called a lattice-based model based on the way it appears when it's drawn out as a tree. So if you see access control and lattice-based, mandatory access could could well be your your answer. So access controls are are necessary to provide confidentiality and availability of objects. So it's enforcing our CIA. And, And there are quite a few different types of access controls. We've touched on some of these in previous domains. Now we're we're talking more about their application in the context of identity and access management. So if we look at that list, we have preventative, deterrent, detective, administrative, logical, or technical, two words for the the same type of control. Then we have physical, corrective, compensating, directive, and recovery control. So the three primary types are preventative, detective, and corrective. Now we're going to step through all 10 of these, and I'm going to call out some key characteristics that will help you memorize these 10. So we have preventative, which is a control designed to stop unwanted or unauthorized activity from occurring. So a good example of this would be a fence or a lock or a biometric authentication mechanism or a man trap. So if I put uh, you know, a lock on a door, you're not getting through. I'm going to stop you unless you've got a key, right? Now, by comparison, we have deterrent access controls, which are really deployed to discourage violations. So examples of that would include uh, 
things like uh, a security badge you pick up at the front door or a security guard. Now you'll notice there's some overlap here, and you might uh, ask me, you know, why, you know, how how can a fence be both a preventative and a de- deterrent control? Well, let's think about that. When we talked about fences, the sweet spot was eight feet, right? An eight foot fence with barbed wire is going to be a preventative measure. You're gonna struggle to get over that, right? That's going to to push everybody back. A deterrent, like a a four foot fence, for example, would be a deterrent to a casual intruder. I can hop a four foot fence, right? So that's, that's the difference. But you'll notice there are unique controls in here. Intrusion alarm, separation of duty, auditing, you know, these elements can deter malicious activity simply for fear of getting caught, right? Continuing down this road, detective controls. These are intended to discover unwanted activity. So discovering activity in progress, hopefully. So security guards, guard dogs, motion detectors, uh, audit trails, these are all ways we can detect, we can discover uh, activity, unauthorized activity in, in progress. And then administrative access controls. I think of these as, as the paperwork uh, types of access controls. So, so policies and procedures, um, hiring practices, background checks, security training, uh, vacation history, uh, supervisors, personnel controls, lots, lots of people and policy here. And then finally, logical and technical. So these are hardware or software mechanisms. So this is, this is technology being applied to access control. So these are things like smart cards, passwords, biometrics, um, intrusion detection, uh, access control lists, firewalls. And then there are physical controls. So these are intended to prevent direct contact. Quite a few different options here. Fences fall into this. Uh, bollards, man traps, locks, swipe cards, guard dogs, etc. So we're, we're trying to prevent direct physical contact with portions of a facility. Next on the list of access controls, we have corrective, which is deployed to restore systems to normal after an unwanted or unauthorized activity has occurred. So these have minimal capability to, to really respond to access violations or to automatically correct them. So for example, an intrusion detection system will identify uh, an unwanted activity and send us an alert, right? But it doesn't automatically correct it. Uh, antivirus will alert us that a virus has been discovered, but it won't necessarily remove it automatically unless we've authorized it to do so. It will, you know, certainly alert us. Uh, compensative, uh, compensative access controls provide options to other existing protocols to basically aid in enforcement. So security policies, uh, personnel supervision, work task procedures, these are really just supporting some of the other controls in the list here. Now directive are deployed to direct, confine, or control the actions of a subject to force or encourage compliance with policy. So, So security guards, guard dogs, policies, posted notifications, these are directive in nature. They are encouraging Uh, a particular type of behavior. And then recovery uh, controls are deployed to repair or restore. So so unlike corrective, recovery are are intended to to actually repair or restore. These are going to be more advanced or complex capabilities in, in responding to access violations versus that corrective control. So backups and restores, for example, fault tolerant drive systems, server clustering, Antivirus software can be a recovery control if we configure it to automatically repair or restore, right? So this again is, is uh, pointing out the fact that, that a control that, that a, a control mechanism can, can fit into more than one category, and in this case, depending on how it's configured when we talk about antivirus. But a recovery control is intended to repair or restore. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the elements of risk. So risk is the possibility or the likelihood that a threat can actually exploit a vulnerability and cause damage to assets. And we can uh, assess risk quantitatively, uh, which means using formulas, or we can do it qualitatively, which is using some some estimates based on our experience. Uh, So asset valuation identifies the value of the asset. So asset valuation is focused on asset value. 
and threat modeling identifies threats against these assets. Vulnerability analysis identifies weaknesses in an organization's valuable assets. We're not worried about assets that don't really have value. I don't care much about the stack of, uh, of printer paper over on the table. I care about that uh, e-commerce system that holds my customer data, right? So you'll want to be familiar with access control attacks for the exam. So dictionary attacks are one example, and they would use all dictionary words to attempt to find the correct password in the hopes the user has used a, a standard word out of a dictionary. And that's where we can use uh, password policies to help. Uh, a brute force attack is a uh, an attack that attempts to break a password by trying all possible words. And, and really, password complexity and attacker tools and compute power are going to determine the efficacy of that kind of attack. Uh, a spoofed logon screen, so that implements a fake logon screen. And when a user attempts to log on, the screen will send the username and password to the hacker. So, so a spoofed logon screen could be when we have a compromised system and that, that screen has been faked, or sometimes you'll see in phishing attacks where you get a fake you know, Gmail logon screen, for example, and you're encouraged to change your Gmail password. So spoofed logon screens are uh, another threat. Uh, sniffer attacks. So in a sniffer attack, uh, the attacker uses a packet capturing tool. That's the key element here. So they can capture, analyze, and read data that's sent over a network looking for information they can use to, you, uh, to work against us. An attacker can easily read data that's sent over a network in clear text, so encrypting data in transit is going to stop this kind of attack. Spoofing attacks, this is, this is where the, uh, the attacker is pretending to be something or someone else. This is used in many kinds of attacks, including access control. The attacker is often trying to obtain credentials, like in the, the spoofed you know, Google logon screen that you know, typically comes through a phishing attack. Many spoofing attacks, uh, you know, like email spoofing, phone number spoofing, IP spoofing, a lot of phishing attacks are going to focus on using spoofing methods. Another type of access control attack is social engineering. This is just any attempt by an attacker to convince someone to pr provide information they wouldn't normally, like a password, or to perform an action they wouldn't normally, like clicking on a malicious link. Or, or it could even be uh, telling somebody uh, information about vacation schedules or you know when somebody comes into the office normally because oftentimes social engineers are trying to gain access to the IT infrastructure or the physical facility and so understanding how people move around the uh, the organization can be really useful to them so the best defense for social engineering is security awareness training you know just training users to not give away information to parties they don't know and to not click on links that they aren't sure are legitimate. Phishing attacks. So phishing attacks are commonly used to trick users into giving up personal information uh, via some sort of email, a malicious link, or a malicious attachment. Lots of tools out there today to prevent phishing attacks and even tools to simulate phishing attacks so you can educate your users in uh, the real world from day to day. So there are some phishing variants we want to be familiar with. So spear phishing targets specific groups of users. You know, there, there are basic phishing attacks that aren't very clever where, you know, every user in your organization gets, you know, blanketed with a, hey, your, your Gmail password has been compromised. You need to click here and change your password quickly. We actually had uh, a government entity, a, a campaign, a political campaign that was, uh, was hacked through that sort of general phishing attempt, but a spear phishing attempt is going to be a little more nuanced in that the attacker has done some, some uh, advanced investigation of your organization and they're targeting specific groups with a more specific type, type of attack that seems relevant to their job. Uh, a variant of this is whaling, which is a targeted attack on your high-level executives or other high-value targets. Whale, whaling is going af after that that high value target. And then vishing uses voice to carry out the exploit. So phishing is really the number one cyber attack in the world today. This is a really common uh, way in the door to then uh, compromise your organization in other ways. So you want to know these three variants for the exam for sure. I, I expect you'll see something on phishing come up. And then finally, there's 
an access aggregation attack. That's that's where the attacker combines or, or aggregates non-sensitive information to learn sensitive information. This is used often in reconnaissance attacks. Um, let me give you an example of, of an internal um, access aggrega- aggregation of, of non-sensitive data. So let's say we have a, a shipping clerk that has access to to order records, but the organization restricts access to total sales volume. But uh, the shipping clerk has access to the order records, so they can pull all those individual records together and add them up to total to get that that sensitive total sales volume. That, that's one example, but it's combining non-sensitive information to get to the sensitive information. So know these common access control attacks and how to prevent them. So to prevent these types of attacks, I've given you some of that information in line uh, in, in, as we talked about them, but, but a couple of reminders here. So passwords should be long, complex, and changed. So that's where we used password policies to enforce complexity and history. So we have to have a strong password policy. And then enforcing other measures like account lockout after you know, X number of logon attempts. And for the spoofed logon screens, the best prevention is to have secure endpoints where these fake screens can't be implemented. And in the case of, of the external uh, scenario where you're being sent to like a spoofed, you know, Gmail screen, for example, that's where we're using phishing protections to deal with, uh, with that sort of exploit. So other attacks, there are a couple of not specifically access control attacks I wanted to talk to you about, but just to get these out here, because they're, they're sort of um, fringe. So Tempest allows electronic emanations that uh, monitors produce to be read from an, an, a distance. This is going to be effective on CRT monitors, so this is something of a legacy attack. Uh, you know, with modern with uh, monitor displays, you know, mon- modern monitor displays, um, shoulder surfing is going to be the way you deal with that. Uh, white noise, which is broadcasting false traffic at all times to mask and hide the presence of real emanation. So that's sending kind of a distracting signal down the line, essentially. So I'm not sure you'll see these. I want to bring them up because they are definitely called out in the guide. Uh, RF, RFID, barcoding and inventory, these represent the ability to prevent theft, uh, which reduces risk. So you'll see RFID, barcoding and inventory in in uh, the world of asset management, and these are intended to prevent theft and reduce risk. So these are not going to be you know, technical areas, but think think of risk reduction uh, around asset theft when you see RFID barcoding and inventory. So Kerberos, which which is your your primary authentication protocol with a- Active Directory on premises. Uh, the primary purpose is authentication because it allows a user to prove their identity. Right? They can. Uh, claim their identity and then prove it with a, a password or multiple factors. It also provides a measure of confidentiality and integrity using uh, symmetric key encryption. But these the, those are not Kerberos' primary purpose. It's really there for for authentication. Um, it doesn't include logging capability, so it's not there to provide accountability. You can you know there, there are ways to. Uh, to, to work that logging into the process and implementation, though. So Kerberos specifically doesn't provide that. Replay attacks are a pretty common attack against Kerberos, where the authentication sequence is captured and then replayed in an attempt to access other resources on the network. In that same vein, uh, a pass the hash attack is something that's been historically common, where the attacker dumps the hashed password from memory and then passes that in lateral movement attempts. And that's it for Domain 5. I hope you're getting value out of the series. Make sure you hit the notification bell so you get a heads up when I drop part 6 tomorrow. And until next time, take care and stay safe.